No. Hola, ¿qué tal a todos? Ay, esa. Hello. Good afternoon. I cannot see you very well because I'm blinded by the spotlights. So, good afternoon, everyone. This is an initiative that we had at the program committee of the technical forum for this year. So that, as we say in Uruguay, in the south, to really wake up a bit. And the idea is to not have this classroom modality and listen to you so that you can share with us problems or ideas that you might have on distributed denial of service attacks or denial of service attacks. So to start, I wanted to give you some numbers. Yesterday we had the meeting of the Laxi CERT community. In one of the talks, we heard that 23 to 49 percent of all internet traffic in one day is malicious traffic. And we also heard that Fortinet gave us this numbers, the economic impact of a DDoS attack by our for an organization can account for 20 to 40,000 US dollars. And if you are considering the cost of the downtime, this might be estimated to 140,000 and 540,000 US dollars. That is the cost of the downtime. Then we also had a presentation by John Brown from Team, Team Cameroon, who is here with us now, where Team Cameroon gave us a couple of numbers for the region, which was food for thought. And it turns out that last year, only in the first semester, for example, they detected in 57 different regions of Latin America and the Caribbean that there had been denial of service attacks. These were 2,794 ESNs that were attacked, and more than 750,000 attacks during the first semester of 2023. The largest was 75 million packets per second. This it was 756 gigabytes per second. They also give us the numbers that Argentina and Brazil were the countries that were attacked most, with attacks that lasted between 5 and 15 minutes. So before we go to the trigger questions that Wesley will be reading out gradually so that we start sharing experiences, he will also give you these numbers and what these imply in our daily lives. So the idea of this open mic session is to speak about this topic. And the issue of DDoS attacks has a strong impact on society. They have a strong impact in our personal lives. And let me give you a question and please raise your hands. And all those of you who have children, who has kids? I see quite a lot of you, I would say 50% at least, have children. So let us assume that we have a hypothetical situation. This is purely hypothetical situation that your child is hospitalized awaiting a heart transplant. And your phone rings. We have a donor. Now we have to wait a while because the transfer system, or organ transfer system between hospitals in the same country is interconnected and is now not working. It has crashed. And the reason why this has crashed is that there is a DDoS attack. So how would you feel when you learn that your child might lose the opportunity of receiving a heart because of denial of service attacks. The denial of service attacks have 
a very high impact on society. We have the numbers that Frida shows us. We have the numbers of the other entities that evaluate the internet penetration and the connectivity service is really essential for us to live. live. And if we recap and think back three years, in the midst of the pandemic, many could only study, work, live, and have leisure time through connectivity services. And how many of these were impacted by denial of service attacks? So what we want to do here, and we count on your support, we count on you sharing your experiences with us, is how are you dealing with situations such as these? Those who are already attacked, those who are never attacked, are you protecting yourself? Are you now ready for a potential denial of service attack? So the first question or the first issue that we would like to listen to from you is about the types of problems that you have had to face in your operations as a result of denial of service attacks. The two microphones are open and I would like to listen to, to you. Arturo, you're just walking past, you can open, use a microphone. One question. Please say your name so that we can all meet you and can interact better. Good afternoon. I am Andres from Brazil, from the National Development Network. I apologize for speaking Spanish. Now, when we speak of denial of service, in the academic network in Brazil, we had devices to mitigate these attacks. We have a very big backbone, but one of the things that you mentioned is that the impact is very big. The national network in Brazil has a network that has to do with medicine that links all the university hospitals. And very often when there is an attack, then the classrooms and some of the surgical procedures that have to be transmitted are affected by an attack such as these. And when people cannot really take part in these lessons, in these activities. So in order to prevent these situations, you didn't need to buy devices for mitigation purposes, but these devices have to carry out the filtering and anti-spoofing task as we heard yesterday in the Lexi search meeting. So as I was saying, this is something that affects everyone, not only the access providers or the network that was affected. So everyone is affected. It's the students who couldn't participate in these classes, the transmission that couldn't be done. So this is what I wanted to comment on. Thank you for your comments. And what, what our friend Andre just said is very important. Academic networks, university networks also suffer impact like this. And the connectivity service is about connecting people. And when we are affected by any of these problems or leading people to be disconnected, that will have a big impact. Junior Coraza from Teleking, Brazil. I will try to speak Spanish because I think that most here speak Spanish. We are a company that has a scrubbing center and we work with DDoS mitigation. And we have a lot of experience and we have dealt with many attacks. We have to look at this from two points of view. First of all, mitigation. Then, what can your 
as spoofing is the first thing to do to make sure that the supplier or the provider is not an attacker. We have spoken about spoofing vastly, but we still this is still a very big problem, very difficult to mitigate because UDP attacks and spoofing are. I mean, it is it is very difficult to at, to mitigate an attack of this nature. It is not enough that we all do it, that small providers do it, or large operators do it. Here in China, Japan, Russia, in all of our countries, there are many attackers perpetrating these attacks. I am from Brazil. Last year, we saw a significant increase in D DOS attacks to our networks. Small, medium, very large providers suffer from these attacks. We do DDoS mitigation. We have implemented scrubbing centers for some of these clients. I can share data. But just one big supplier that has about 150 long streams. Uh, attackers will attack all of the downstream ASNs from one supplier at the same time. So we're speaking about one terabyte per second. So that's not an attack that takes a long time. It's just three, four minutes, one hour, and then three, four minutes. Right now, we're having another problem with the attacks. These are TCP attacks. It's not a lot of bandwidth, maybe just 100 giga, which is not much for an attack. But this is a TCP attack, 200 million packets per second, even one. A provider, there is no router that can do it. So is it a problem? Yes, it is a big problem. But it is a problem for all of us, from vendors, attackers, and the ones receiving the attack. So in Brazil, the question is whether you have been attacked or not yet. Now the question is when, because you will be attacked. So we have all, we all need to be protected. We all need our filters, black holes, upstream for attack mitigation. Because at some point, you will unfortunately suffer a DDoS attack. That is the reality in Brazil today. Thank you, Junior, for your comment. And I want to mention that DDoS attacks exist because, I mean, these packets are coming from somewhere. And the main problem that we see today is that some ISPs, because, I mean, they don't have robust security policies, will allow for these fake packets, these spoofed packets, to leave their networks, and their networks become vectors for their attacks. So zombies, bots, of course, these will continue to exist. But if we have a militarized zone and we don't allow these packets to go outside the network, the impact on neighboring networks will be reduced. It is important to implement security or protection measures. I mean, it is better to have health insurance and not having to use it than needing one and not having it. Jose Cotua from Chile. I want to share three examples of things that we have had to face and how I have somewhat solved them. The first one is with telephone IP Aster, in, in particular with Linux servers. We were severely attacked. Well, there, there were quite many attempts for denial of registry, denial of calls, or an attempt for a fake registry or fraudulent registry. 
So in addition to protecting services, to keep them inside with a private IP and not let them out on the internet, but when we have to put the telephone central online, Linux itself provides firewall tools, but these but we managed to apply the dropping technique for the packet pre-tracking before the OS tracks the packet. Once it's tracked and captured, and I mean, the connection is established, well, it's happened already. So in IP tables or IP chains in the past, we'll, have, we'll work with a wrap table before tracking. So the CPU, whenever there is an attack, it will reduce quite significantly in contrast with regular chains where the CPU shoots up. Now the second point, many CCH attempts, many attacks, oh, it's very common to receive attacks on the DNS to be thrown against the DNS over the course of the day. And so we filter with the OS itself. So with regards to DNSs on IPv6, since we have many IPs, we do three things. One, we save some prefixes that we don't publish on the internet. I uh, slash 32, I will save a few. I will save save a few slashes uh, 36 and I won't publish it on the internet. And if I have an attack, I will change the IP of my servers. I mean, if you have authority, that will be a bit more delicate because you have to wait a certain period of time. But in places where we have many internet exit points, we have many DNSs and we use different IP addresses for different segments. Because if I get one, one, one IP attacked, I have another way out and I, I, I will keep the service. Then we have decoupled the IP we give the client from the IP the server does the iteration. So we are able to be a, a bit more protected in addition to the firewall or pre-connection firewall rules and additional criteria like not accepting packets we know are destructive and another type of attack that we have also detected is many CCH attempts and desired traffic. And we've done, in the case of IPv4, when possible, we, we save one slash 24 or several, if that is possible. So whenever there is an attack, we can lower or we can use a prefix. We will use that slash 24. We're going to change the client's NAT. So it is seen with a new prefix. So we put down the one that is being attacked. And another technique that we have used is that we have the BGP session. We're going to have the same prefix out with one supplier and we also put it out through a data center. If that prefix is being attacked locally, since we don't have bandwidth to front it, I will pull it down from there and I will put it up in the data center with a 40 giga and I can front it a bit further. And then I bring the critical traffic that I need through a VPN or a safer connection. Similar to what Cloud Fire, Fire is doing, but we do it manually. So the techniques that we have used sort of revolve around having backup, IP redundancy, sites. So you have to detect the attacks and moving prefixes from one point to the next or pulling out the prefix through a BGP, through a data center, exchange helps, a traffic exchange helps, and if the content is there, you at least are left with something while the attack passes. And well, those are some of the tactics that we have used among others. Thank you. Just a quick comment before the next question comes. We, 
Well, you were speaking, uh, my LACNIC, my LACNIC, our sister, and as a security report, we published that many times about the technical experts operating the networks might not be familiar with the report because it's usually administrators who will access Milagnik. So I encourage everyone to visit those reports. And if you are not the ones responsible for managing the infrastructure, please make sure that you send these reports to those who are. There we publish open resources and, and persons sex open to the world. We know that servers that are not well configured are many times used for attacks to attack other infrastructures. So this not only causes problems, but also causes for those resources to be put on a blacklist, as we mentioned the other day. So there, we publish internet resources that have faced this type of trouble, and we explain how we need to configure them so those servers are well configured and closed. At LACNIC's CSERT, we have a set of sensors for members, and you can install them in your networks for CCH ports. 22 and port 23 as well. And the great thing is that you can access a dashboard with a lot of information. That is very useful, as you were saying, to be more proactive and say, well, this is happening. This attacker is coming in and they're using these links for this or this or that. And I can transfer that information to monitoring systems and I would be able to avoid an attack by a botnet that is trying, or, or, or maybe one of the compromise indicators that I, I can use for my monitoring system. I don't know if you want to, to add anything else. David McMahon, Colombia. DDTV Mass started providing colocation and hosting services not long ago. We became transit providers not long ago, and by providing this service, we realized that our DDoS attacks have increased 1,000%. The biggest took place two months ago. They attack a hosting for TV CDNs and literally knocked everything down. It was the first time that we had to face an attack of this nature. They saturated a 100 giga port and the equipments were really knocked down. Uh, uh, everything was everything was catching on fire. Nothing can be done. Equipment is saturated. The only solution was to disconnect it all and see what was happening because it took over everything. And the only solution was for the black hole BGP communities. That was the only solution that we found at the time. Our transit provider said, well, that is your trouble. There's nothing that we can do. But the black hole communities helped us. That helped us mitigate it. And little by little, we've been learning. I'm also a consultant. So my second example, I'm a consultant for small ISPs. And we've realized that many ISPs expose many services that should not be exposed, and they receive many DDoS attacks from competitors. So just make sure you live as little as possible exposed on the internet. If you don't have the need to do it, please don't do it, so you can have a better night's sleep. <coughs> Thank you for the interaction. Please hold on a minute because the next question I think will be useful. You already mentioned that about two months ago you received uh, denial of service attacks. Now, please raise your hand those of you here who received some type of denial of service attacks, whichever kind, over the past six months. Uh, 
Can we dim the lights a bit because the blind guys over here at the in the in the top cannot see their hands. So more than half the room over the past six months. And the other question that you might answer is the following. What has been the financial impact of these attacks that you received? If the money, more than one of you raised your hand, please do you have an estimation of how much in US dollars was the loss produced by this denial of service attacks, this attack? Well, that attack we had two months ago cost us quite a relevant number. It's a CDN, a television CDN, where you cannot have downtime. So we had to have an economic compensation. We are minutes about uh, reaching a non-compliance policy. So did you lose clients? No, we did not. But based on your policy, non-compliance policy, you almost did. Good afternoon. I'm Jesus Arturo Pires. I'm professor and researcher at the Monterrey Institute. F over the past four years, I have been studying these attacks. We have several publications through various students of mine. And I wanted to take the floor to ask several questions that I think can be very useful to those of us who work at universities. The first question is something that Junior mentioned, and maybe he can add on, add on to this, is that do you, if you are alert and pay attention to the low rate attacks, because the high rate attacks can be easily identified, because that is when your systems crash, but your low, low rate attacks are not so easily detected. We use machine learning and deep learning models, the two AI models in order to detect these. So when you have a high rate attack, this is easily detected with accuracies above 99%. Now when these are low rate attacks and we have done physical deployments, then this detection rate can drop down to about 70%. I want to take the floor first to ask you whether you are also paying attention to low rate attacks because it is likely that many of you who did not raise your hand are being attacked but with low rate attacks. Secondly, what are the types of tools that you use to detect, at, detect attacks such as these? And thirdly, if there is anyone interested in collaborating with us who can say, well, I'd like to send a student uh, um, trainee to work for your organization and who might be interested in what the results we have in the university, I will be delighted to collaborate. And there was something else that I wanted to ask, but I have forgotten. But okay, for the meantime, those would be my questions. Junior, would you like to add something regarding the slow attacks? Yes, the idea is to have interaction. Yes, go ahead with your answer. So I apologize for my Spanish, but I need to, to speak Spanish so that everyone understands because most of us are Spanish speakers. So here we have a problem. So when you have a low rate, you don't even know that this attack is taking place. But this is slow, and for some of the content, you have a micro tick that's not working very well, and you don't know what the problem is. So all those here in the room, maybe whenever you monitor your devices, please monitor the packets per second. If you have a micro tick in your network that has a problem that is slow, this might be the problem. This might be a low rate attack. And one of the other things is that I can help you work. We can work together in order to better understand this. We can speak afterwards so that we can work together. I remember the other point I wanted to mention, we normally work with data sets of the Cybersecurity Institute from Canada, 
and these are created in controlled environments very often with physical devices but in a laboratory environment so for us it would be also very interesting to have a real data set of traffic that is crossing an IXP or an ISP which can then be stored at least for a while well I do have that information I have that now because that could be something that could be very useful too thank you Junior, could you please tell us about cost how, in terms of losses, what, how much did this amount to? Yes, I'm going to refer to that. So the largest problem I had last year was when one single provider lost $80,000 a month. He had many customers but because of these attacks he had an $80,000 loss in one month and that's a lot of money and the most serious problem is to obtain assistance after the attack that's even worse because mitigation in the cloud when you are under attack is far more expensive if you carry out mitigation prior to attack, it's cheaper. Thank you, Kutua. Now, yes, I think this was most interesting. What's your name, Professor? Jesus, from Mexico. Great. That was an amazing question. I worked for quite a number of years on a similar project. And let me tell you ahead of time that I would love to collaborate in your project and maybe we can speak about a scholarship for one of the students from Chile. Now what I wanted to say is that we developed a top technique to deal with those attacks that are almost unperceptible and this is what we did. We used the logs of the system, the SSH logs, the asterisk logs and fortunately all the servers can send the logs to a remote server, a syslog server, and that syslog server can store these logs in an we can store these, we have millions and millions of logs every day, every hour, and analyzing this is very complex. So what we did was that these logs were stored in the database. So one user tries to access and they cannot do so. This log is registered at a given time. This user couldn't access it. And this is recorded. A call was attempted and this can occur. This is registered. If the microtech has a rule that locks it and blocks it, it sends to the syslog and the syslog stores this in a database. So we have all that information at a very low rate because if someone comes and tries to log in half an hour later they try to do so again and then two hours later but the person is attempting to do so so the rules that we have in the firewall said that if within a minute time for attempts are done please block this but because this was just one attempt in a minute it is not re registered but that could be attempted again and again but in addition to that, we generate automations whereby these enter the database and read the logs. These look for patterns and they might say, well, today an IP did 100 attempts distributed throughout the day or 100 attempts to make calls or they tried to attempted to log in to the Microtech or the FTTP server. So that, that automation starts detecting these patterns and then send out a warning. So when these automations detect this, they can say this with this is through SMP or through SSH. They can identify the device where this pattern occurred and then close the gap. So a low rate attack can over time be blocked by that automation. This is what we call a log inspector. 
So that was one of the techniques that we used. So we, to sum up, we store the logs in a syslog. The syslog sends it to a database. Then we have an automation that analyzes this information, 1,000 records, 1,000 further records. And when they detect a pattern, this is then reported. They have a record on the patterns of incidents. And then you might get a WhatsApp message or an email. But the important thing is that these enter the device and act. They block, they close ports, the uh, services or whatever. But we didn't make too much progress with this work. And it would be therefore quite interesting to expand this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your information. That was very interesting. Yes. I'm Roberto Jorello from NIC PR. I could speak in Spanish, but I'm going to speak in Portuguese. I could make programs, an internet program called Mas Seguro, more secure. These are various areas of the NIC that work in these areas, particularly in the field of education. We share the best security practices with the community that we have to adopt. So in the framework of that program, I have an activity that I'd like to share with you as a contribution. I have direct contact with vendors. I talk to them about the adoption of the best security practices. And what do I see? I see that few implement or deploy anti-spoofing filters. Many don't understand the extent, their scope, and the problems that anti-spoofing filters and the problems that anti-spoofing filters can avoid. There are many actions, but few really understand this. So we need to work with the community. We need to implement anti-spoofing filters. And I think that is one of the main roots of the problem. Another, maybe more administrative aspect is contact points. I see that the community doesn't share. They don't talk to one another. So contact points that are available are many times not used. We have a big project at 6BR for notifications informing which are the IP addresses whose services are open. At the beginning of the program, we saw the number of problems going down, but now we are stagnant. I mean, we reached a point where we cannot go lower. We are thinking of new actions, but what's important is that vendors many times don't even read the emails. They don't have any processes in place where they will read or, and, and process those emails or notifications. So those are my two contributions, basically one more technical with regards to the deployment of anti-spoofing filters, and the other one is how to manage um, attack or abuse messages. Thank you for that information. And let me stress on something that Gilberto mentioned that is so important. Anything that involves being an autonomous system, an internet resource manager goes hand in hand with making a good use of the resources, maintaining security and making the internet safe. And that means that we need to be up to date with all of the emails that certs, see certs, send. And it's not just about reading an email and sending it to the trash bag or that or slash D or slash no zero. That should not be done. This is a joint effort. It is up to all of us to reduce it. I need somebody else to tell me about the financial impact of DDoS. Only two suffered a financial impact out of all of those, all of you who were attacked, or maybe you were not able to 
to evaluate the financial impact? And how about loss of clients? Because maybe I don't know the financial impact of my downtime, but if many of my clients left and are now with my competitors, we once received a report of one of our members who was receiving DDoS attacks and their main concern was that they were losing clients to the competition. Someone said earlier today that there are small ISPs that are attacked by their competitors so they can keep clients, they can steal clients from them. So how much money does that represent? Maybe they even need to shut down after they lose clients. As Wesley just said, maybe many people have suffered attacks, but they've not been able to, to quantify the, the attack as they were busier trying to solve the problem. I feel that across Latin America, there are cases like this. We now see, for example, social media and clients send information to one another. They say, well, we are being attacked. I feel that Latin American clients are have a lot of solidarity. Clients in general are not going to move as easily from one vendor to the next. They need to sign a new con contract, sign a new agreement, DNS, and so on. And these attacks really are done in a few hours. So probably clients the next day are no longer angry about it. I, that's what I've seen in Latin America. Well, you should go to Brazil. Attacks sometimes last two, three weeks. And client migration is big. $80,000, Junior mentioned. We had a client who suffered an attack for two months, two months nonstop. That matches the, the data that Grasse provided. That, that includes what Grace said about Brazil and Argentina. Well, remember what we said earlier, that organizations that have been impacted, the downtown amounted to around $140,000. So we need to find a way to quantify the cost of that lack of operation, of that downtime. Uh, let me ask you something. Who has requested a quotation to enhance security or to hire people that will address security question? And you have not been able to manage to, you have not managed to convince management to hire such resources. The fact that none of you is raising your hand is a clear symptom that we are not looking for security professionals. That is something that I am not considering. That is a must in any organization nowadays to have a, a specialist or someone paying attention to that. And let's pretend that I want to get those resources. How do I justify it? At a nonprofit, maybe, but a corporation or company that will make a living out of their profit, how do I justify it? to our senior management that I need to invest in security. I need statistics. Statistics are number. I need to be able to calculate them. There's a question in the Q&A. Someone online, Yvette Soriano Cruz, in public health services in Mexico, we suffered attacks to our institution institutional mail. All of our users' emails were deleted. We only managed to recover 20% of the content across the entire hospital system. 
That is terrible. If we're looking at costs, if we're looking at losses, I do have experience in some countries. I know that's the case in Brazil, in Mexico, and in other countries. So depending on how long that downtime is for the user, they can request a discount in the monthly fee that they pay. And that's something that we need to contemplate. If I have 10,000 users that are asking for a discount for their 10 or 15 minute downtown, how much will that affect my turnover? So that is another way of calculating the financial cost when you receive DDoS attacks. There were many hands. Many of you raised your hands when we asked how many of you had suffered an attack in the past six months. So out of those who have received an attack, how many use a mitigation or a protection measure against DDoS attacks? Seven, only seven. That is a concerning number. Now, out of these seven, or half of you, and I don't want to be the only one speaking here, please, I encourage some of those seven to tell us which solutions you are using. If you, I mean, did not, many of you didn't raise your hand, so please share with us what measures, what, what can we do to protect against the attacks? Hello. I wanted to provide another example in case of an emergency. For example, when we had the pandemic, many of the educational services were sent online. There was an attack against Google, and many of those teachers who had, were delivering online classes, well, that was no longer possible. After the pandemic, in the four scenarios that were mentioned here, well, one of them was cybersecurity for the different institutions. So that was just another comment. Thank you. Good afternoon, Luciano Santos from NCM, and I will speak Portuguese. We use a different vanguard for mitigation measure a solution for many of our clients. We have people like Junior that offers different solutions. Uh, it takes a long time to deploy it. So if you suffer an attack and if you want to hire someone, if you have to deploy it, well, it, it can take up to four days. And in the meantime, clients will leave. Because if uh, clients expect this to, to be solved under one day, if that does not happen, they will just go to our competitors. So I think that the best solution is prevention. So adopting an anti-spoofing filters, if we are not vectors for that attack, and if we don't activate it. So we need to share and we need to take action across our friends, across our colleagues to try to diminish those attacks. We have John Brown from Team Henry in the audience. They do have solutions. They do have solutions for companies to mitigate attacks. There are some solutions that are free of charge. I know we're running a little bit late. We don't have much time, but you can reach out to, to him during the coffee break. He's right here. So please reach out, and this is an organization that cooperates very closely with all communities to keep the internet safe. Gustavo Garantes from Kio Networks Mexico. We use Ragware 
for anti-DDoS attacks with BGP NetFlow to reduce the response time to our clients. So many times the solutions need to be charged so we can have reach a wider scope of attacks, but we also try to many times translate that cost to the service so protection can be monetized and clients feel safer. In addition to monitoring packages per second to clients and demand tier one or tier two carriers to have at least basic protection in place for our customers. Spanish is very bad, so I will be speaking in No English. worries. Thank you. Um, DDoS, first of all, my name is John Brown. I am with Team Cymru. We, uh, I, I will speak just from a technology perspective. DDoS is a everybody problem. It is not the problem of the victim because there are many victims, right? If the gentleman here to my left is being attacked, then he is a victim, certainly. But if I am his internet provider, I am also a victim. And if she is my internet provider, then she is also a victim. And the machine, the host that is being used for an amplification attack, like a DNS amplification or NTP amplification, they are also the victim. The ISP to that machine, they are a victim. So when we talk about whose problem it is, it is an everybody problem, right? Today, he is the victim of all the traffic, but tomorrow he may also be the victim because there's a computer on his network that is the source of an attack against somebody else. When we talk about cost of, DNA, of a DDoS, right, how do you convince management to spend the money on this? The cost is not just the bandwidth consumed to the victim. It is the cost of the labor for the gentleman earlier that was talking about the attack from two months ago. It is his cost and his colleagues' costs to mitigate to figure out what the problem is and then how to mitigate the problem. It is the cost of the bandwidth that's being used. Some bandwidth contracts are based on consumption or usage. So you are given a gigabit pipe, but you're on a 10 gigabit port. And if you go more than one gigabit worth of data, you are charged extra. And so now you have this extra charge that's there. But I would also say that their cost is the cost of customer experience. Your customer is now having a poor experience on your network. And they're going to go talk about that to others. So you're going to lose uh, a positive reputation in, in a marketplace. So there's a lot of layers of cost that come into a DDoS. Very quickly, I know we're running out of time with regards to spoofing and anti-spoofing. Best in current practice 38, BCP 38, has been around for more than 20 years. Why are you not implementing it, frankly? URPF, Unicast Reverse Path Forwarding, is a simple way to protect the edge of your network from sending spoofed packets. This is something we should all be implementing today. The United Kingdom, a number of years ago, came out and said that the government of the United Kingdom would not buy internet access from anybody that could not prove they block source spoofed packets. So there's an economic reason, because if you want to sell to the government of the United Kingdom, you need to prove that you do not allow source spoofed packets. Maybe that's an economic reason that needs to be thought about in this region. Get rid of source spoofed packets and a large percentage of this problem will disappear. It will not solve the TCP application layer attacks. It will not solve the send floods attacks, but it will get rid of the UDP and amplification volumetric type attacks. I'm not gonna pitch my company. That's not my purpose right now. If you wanna find me, Reg, Redback, I'm in the hallway. Thank you for your points. Yo quiero final, tenemos alguna remota. Tenemos una remota a, muy, muy agotado de tiempo el conversatorio. 
We have a remote question. This was a wonderful open mic. I'm Juan Carlos Marquez. I work for Cabase. And I have to support the development of traffic exchange points in the provinces of Argentina. This is just a comment. It's not solutions, but these are more questions. I think that the issue of the denial of service attacks is something that is here to stay and something we have to deal from now onwards. The challenge we face as an internet community where we share these spaces is first to raise the awareness of everyone of the minimum things that we have to incorporate into our infrastructure and to configure this so that we have a common basis. We have to work from the community in order to determine which are the most effective measures and also to start requiring from those who sell services to us to include some form of providing security. I'm speaking about the carriers. You are all aware that there are providers who sell services that cost X and if you want them to include security, it's X plus one. So also to require that the services provider should give us this tool and not to get used to a low cost type of economy. Thank you. So let's see if we manage to see the remote question. I'm checking the Q&A here in the Zoom. We cannot read the questions. So we're going to answer the question in the Q&A on another occasion. And we would like to ask the uh, staff to convey this to us. Oh, here it is. Five more minutes, please. So we don't see any open questions in the plenary session. So I wanted to finish this open mic session using an expression that John used when he took the floor. When we are suffering a DDoS attack, we are all victims, every single one of us. So this is a joint task that we have. It is something that we all have to do to work and mitigate these things. This open mic session was just the starting point. We have LACNOG's discussion list. We have the security discussion list at LACNIC. We urge you to subscribe to these lists so we can work together for a more secure internet with an internet with less DDoS attacks and so that these attacks do not have an impact not only on our businesses, but also so that the lives and coexistence, the social coexistence we have, and all the social responsibility that is involved in our connectivity services is prevented. These attacks do not affect all these. Thank you very much for your participation. Grace, over to you. Thank you very much, everyone. We're very pleased because we were a bit anxious about the interest that this session would have. This was a good option. And please let the FTL program committee to know that if there are any topics you'd like to include in this open mic session, and please stay connected. There are many common projects, projects that were proposed and and well, we now close the last session of the Tlacnix Technical Forum. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And all the speakers who came, presented, the, made their presentations, and this is what makes Tlacnix a strong and resistant community. We have a 30-minute break. Well, now it's a 22-minute break and resume at 4.30 local time. 2130 UTC.